just previous to the service today, I looked up in Webster's Dictionary, humility. It said this, the absence of pride. Now, that didn't tell me very much about humility, so I'm glad that I got into the Word of God and God's Word declared what humility is all about. We are told in 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourself, all of you, with humility. It is a very important thing for you and I to put on the clothes of humility. What are the clothes of humility? If every member of the body of Christ worldwide would put on the clothes of humility, things would be totally different in the churches of Jesus Christ. There is little humility in a lot of churches. There's little humility in a lot of Christians. But if a person isn't humble as God describes humility, then that person has no encounter with God that is really deeply personal. Because God puts down those that are proud and draws up close to him those that are humble. What is it that causes God to say, this is a humble person? It is a person, and we'll develop this, that simply depends on God for everything. They don't have this attitude, I can do this without God. They recognize that God is the reason they can do anything. They are totally sold out to God, and that is a humble person. Billy Graham was a very humble individual. He knew that any place he had a crusade, he had to have the people praying in the churches that were gathered around to support that crusade. And this would be months before the crusade. In fact, his model was this. Before I have a crusade, there are three things that I want you to recognize are necessary. If these three things aren't there, I will not come to your area. What were those three things? Simply prayer, prayer, and prayer. He recognized that that isn't hard for you to remember, is it? <laughs> he recognized that if we don't get God's power through anything we do, we are doing some of it on our own, and therefore we can take the glory for it instead of give all the glory to God. This church is a result of God doing everything. Your life, whether you know it or not, is a result of God's grace, God's mercy, you are not fit for the kingdom of God until God comes into your life and transforms you. Humility recognizes there is no good thing in me except what Jesus Christ has put within me at salvation. Paul the Apostle, a great man of God, a man of God that understood what it was to be a wretched sinner, could sing that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He called himself, when he was a mighty, godly apostle, the chief of the apostles, as many have said, he called himself the chiefest of sinners. He knew the grace of God took him and took him from okaying the death and giving the sign that the death of Stephen was to take place to all the times he went into search of Christians and tortured them and put them to death. He knew what the grace of God was all about. I say to you and I who are Christians who have received Christ as our Savior, do we know what the grace of God is all about? 
without that grace, I cannot be humble. But with the knowledge of that grace, experientially in my life, there's nothing I can do but say, it's all God. It's all God. When somebody praises you, and it does say, let another person praise you, it's a response of thanksgiving. But if you don't know it was God that gave you that ability, that anointing, that gift, then you have failed to be humble. It is all God. If you get anything out of this message today, it won't be a product of Pastor Horn. It's a product of God through Pastor Horn. I am nothing, but Christ is everything. You have to come to a point, just like I have, that you are nothing without God. I can't even walk, goes the song, without him holding my hand. There's no time in my Christian walk with God that I can say, I've arrived. I don't have to study the scripture anymore. I already know the scripture. I've been a, a, a reader of the word of God since a childhood. But that's not a fresh adventure with God. That's not saying, I need you to give an application of your word to me today. I need to know what you're saying to me in my situation, in my circumstance right now. I am not able to do it on my own. How different it would be if the church's impact was that kind of impact. I'm afraid there's rivalries in the church. There is animosity in the church. There's proud spirits in the church. And therefore, it causes division in the church eventually. But a church that has learned, at least for the majority, that it's all God, and we depend on God completely, and we give God the glory for everything in our life that is good, is a church that recognizes the importance of humility what glory would God receive from the church? church's predominant trait of humility? What would they receive from a church that was totally subservient to Jesus Christ and recognized every decision, every circumstance had to be okayed by God through prayer? All right, that's what you're going to see on the screen right now. Number one, what do people view humility as? Some Christians pi picture humility as letting themselves be run over by others. That's a humble person. That is not a humble person. That's a stupid person. Humility isn't letting people run over you. Humility is something that is spiritual. It's not physical. Number two, some picture it as dressing in robes and sandals. Have you ever seen them? And like St. Francis, forsaken everything in the world. That's humility. Go up on a mountain and cloister yourself, wear a robe, and you'd think that person was humble. They're, they're just giving up everything. Years ago, I was teaching in a college, and this guy came in. A lot of different people would come in because God was there, and they were drawn. And he came in with this robe on. I mean, he looked like Friar Tuck. Only he wasn't plump. And he would walk around as if he was the humblest person on the earth. He was not. When God taught him something about real humility, he left the church because he wasn't humble. He was proud of what he was, a humble person. You don't know you're humble when you're humble. Somebody else does. 
they will say of you at some point, boy, you are humble, aren't you? But if you go around parading, I'm humble. <clears throat> Look at me. All praise to me. <laughs> it's crazy. That which I think is humility has nothing to do with what I'm wearing. A humble person can be dressed beautifully or dressed very lousily. And uh, you know they're humble because of their words and their actions, but they can be dressed that way and not be humble. So it is something that your spirit witnesses with their spirit that they are truly in love with God and it all belongs to God that has happened in their life. So it is not running, letting someone run you down. Number two, it is not forsaking everything in the world. Number three, others think humility is about not offending people. But that's just man-pleasing rather than God-honoring. None of these images is the heart of what humility is. That's not humility. Humility, number four, isn't a self-directed trait. Humility is not a self-directed trait. Now, what is it? Number five, by design, humility is relational and its effect is powerful. Humility has to do with how you deal with others, what you think about others, and how you esteem them better than yourself. You don't esteem them less than yourself. You esteem them as worthy of receiving the attention that you need. I'd rather they got that attention. Humility is, if I get an award, I, I think she should have got that reward. That's true humility. I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about others. It's like that song, others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, let me live for others that I might live for thee. And in another translation, it's might act like thee. The word of God is so clear that humility has to do with how you think about yourself and how you think about others. It's relational. All right, now, in the word of God, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 7, we read, the apostle Paul is teaching, have this mind among yourselves. Have this mind above, uh, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, God Almighty, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was in the form of God. He was God, but he didn't put himself above the Father. But he emptied himself. When he came down to this earth, he operated in his humanity. But he was directed by his divinity. And it goes on by taking on the form of a servant. If you want to be a humble person, you're going to have to be a servant of people. Jesus showed that when he washed the dirty feet of the disciples. They all were trying to get ahead of the other disciples. They wanted first place. And Jesus said, you need to learn humility. And you need to recognize even as I, Jesus, Wash your feet, you must wash each other's feet. Does that mean we start washing each other's feet? It's teaching humility. It's teaching 
that is God's way of showing that a person is given over to being nothing but you being everything. It's not a downcast attitude. It's not a I'm no good attitude. It's an attitude that you're better. You're better and I want to serve you. I want to be your servant for Christ's sake. So you understand it's not putting yourself down. It's actually fitting into the role God wants you to fit into, and that is being a humble person. For you then are like God, because God is a humble God. If God was not, you and I will still be in our sins, and we would be hopelessly destroyed by our sins. What Paul said about humility is profoundly counter-cultural. It's not the way the culture thinks of it. Humility in the culture is some of those things I said in the beginning and perhaps others. But God's humility is that you're thinking like God thinks. He puts others ahead of himself. He died on the cross, Jesus did, because he put you and I ahead of himself. The Father raised him from the dead because he had accomplished what the Father wanted him to accomplish. That is pay for you and me and our sins and give us a way to heaven if we received it. But a person that has not learned humility will not receive it because they think they can be good enough. They can be good enough to go to heaven on their own. They think, I haven't done any bad things, and they think that's going to open the doors of heaven to them. Or I go to church five times a week, but I've never received Christ because, you see, the five times a week, sure, I'm a humble person. I, I go and I serve people. Friends, you can serve people in the church all you want to, but you're not humble unless you're doing it for the right reason. What is the reason I sing? Is it to glorify God or to glorify myself? Did you notice I sang so good today? By the way, I have not heard that from any of our singers, but I've heard it in the past. They were proud of their ability to sing that song. A humble person says, I may make a mistake, but I'm going to do it again until I get it right. And we had a humble person today. The Word of God says a humble person never gives up because they're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for Jesus Christ. I'm in the ministry for Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it because I've got nothing else to do in the daytime. I do Bible studies on the Internet, not because, my goodness, I... Uh, don't have anything else to do, so I think, why not get on there? Someone said to me, you're on there an awful lot. I know I'm on there an awful lot because God told me to do it. I'm doing what God told me to do. And it's not because I'm a humble person. It's because I'm an obedient person. Are you obedient to what God wants you to do? Well, notice what Paul said about this counter uh, counter cultural situation number three which is actually number six the world despises and mocks humility godly humility the world says you are you're a loser you're a loser because you're you're putting other people first yet peter says that god exalts those who walk in humility I want to be exalted by God, so I've got to learn how to be humble before God and give credit to God because God is the one doing all things. A humble person recognizes they're nothing without God. 
My back again to Billy Graham. He said this statement once in one of his messages. He said, if God didn't anoint me, I'd be nothing. And he meant it. And I heard all his team had the same attitude. If God didn't do it through them, they would be a loser. They'd be nothing. But because they recognized God had called them to that task of being evangelists, then they were going to do it until they couldn't do it anymore, which was a sign God had said, no more. Someone else will take over. But they were humble enough to listen to God when he said, stop. And they were humble enough to listen to God when he said, keep going. It's God. It's all God. But the world mo mocks at that and makes fun of it. This doesn't mean that they're operating that operating in humility is easy. It isn't. Putting other people before yourself isn't easy because we have a tendency to want to put ourselves before other people. We go to a restaurant and the waitress waits on someone that came in after us. Oh, I don't think that's fair, do you? You're proud, aren't you? You didn't put them ahead of you. Or perhaps, I don't know why that individual's so slow that's in front of me. I've, I want to go a little faster. And they, they're just dragging themselves in this automobile of theirs, if that's an automobile. They don't know why that person's going slow. They have no understanding. Perhaps they're going slow because they've had accidents and they don't want to take a chance. We are not humble when we presume on people. What is the great transgression according to the word of God? Presumption. Presuming you know something you don't know. Presuming you know something about an individual that you have no, no understanding of, nor is it true. Presuming a person goes into a bar that he's going to get drunk in that bar when all he's doing is getting a drink of water. There is a story about that where the, these deacons, or was it deaconesses? I'm not sure at this point, but either one saw this man, this church member, go into a bar, and they started spreading that, hey, this guy is drinking in that bar, and and he's doing all kinds of probable things in that bar. And they put him before the church. And they found out he was just thirsty. And he went in to get a drink from their fountain and came back out. But these busy bodies already concluded because they're not humble. Humility doesn't think evil of one another. But thinks the best of one another. This doesn't then indicate humility. According to Peter in 1 Peter 5, 5, which we read, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. A proud Christian is going to be opposed by God. You don't want to be opposed by God. Note how this verse is double-edged. Our humility is spirit-empowered, spirit while at the same time, God is resisting our pride. Are you a proud person? Now, you can be proud of your work you, you do. You can say, I did a good job. But pride is something you've got to watch out for because it can go into the realm of thinking you're better than someone else when you're not. In short, if we operate in flesh-driven desire and effort, we cut ourselves off from God's highest purpose for us because of our pride. Pride stops people from wanting to be with you. If you're a proud individual, they skirt around you every time you come near them because they've heard it all before. 
I'm such a great person. And they don't want to hear it again because they know it's false. It's not real because you've displayed it in your statements. Nobody has to, and I'll say this again, nobody has to tell people they're humble. People know they're humble. And nobody has to tell somebody, I'm very proud. They already know you're very proud because everything you say shows how good you are and how bad somebody else may be. The Word of God says simply this. Humble yourselves, therefore. Humble yourselves, therefore. This is the sixth verse of 1 Peter 5. Under the mighty hand of God, who is the one that determines what I'm going to do if I'm a humble person? God. His mighty hand will take care of me. His mighty hand will lead me. His mighty hand will protect me. And we'll see that even more so in a moment. Peter laid out three ways that Christians are led by humility. So I exhort the elders, said Peter. Who are the elders? The pastors, the leaders. As a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd, shepherd the flock of God. Lead the flock of God as a shepherd shepherds sheep. Exercising oversight. Now notice this, and you'll see the first one on number seven. Only seven, but one, first one there. He's saying this, if you're going to be a humble leader, you must not be a humble leader under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. You're not under compulsion to do it. God is enforcing you to do it. He is giving you an opportunity to do it. And if it applies to a pastor, it applies to a, uh, the people of God as well. Whatever God gives you to do should not be, I can't get out of it. I've got to do it because who else can do it? And I've got to do it because I'm so good at it. Not under compulsion. It should not be that you're serving God because you feel, boy, if I die and he asks me what I've done for him, I, I got to do something. After all, these preachers all say you could die at any moment. And so I better do something. It's under compulsion. It's not willingly. It's not because you love God with all of your heart. You love God so much you, you can't. You ask him, Lord, can I do something else? Can I do something more? Not lay that away, but do something more. That's a humble person, but they're not compelled to do it. They are willingly desiring to do it. I said to Bob, Eli, before the service, because one of our singers is not available tonight. I said, would you sing your song tonight as well? He didn't put up a lot of, well, I, I don't know. Immediately he said, yes, I'd like to do it. It's not under compulsion. I didn't twist his arm and say, you would like to, wouldn't you? Too many people force people into doing something they don't want to do and that's because they're proud and they force people out of their pride they want to make sure they get the best people so they say you're you're the best you're going to do it but an individual that's humble says would you like to do it it would be a great blessing if you decided to but it's all right if you don't want to. You see, it's not under compulsion, but they become willing. Number two, they don't do it for shameful gain, but eagerly. They don't ask, well, uh, how much can you pay me for this? 
They don't say, well, can you get anyone else? They are eager to do the will of God. If there is a need in the church, they're eager to meet it.